Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our consumer behavior class. Um, as always, at the beginning, could you please let me know in the chat if you can see me and if you can hear me? Just write a quick message in the chat, please. Hi again, everyone. Hello, James. Hi. You can see me and you can hear me. Great. Good for you. Hi, Anna. Hi, guys. We don't have too many visitors yet. Maybe they're going to show up later. Who knows? Um, how are you guys doing? Can you, can you just send me a quick message, perhaps, in the chat? Is everything okay with you guys? Where are you two? Are you currently here in Austria or are you back home? I'm doing okay, thank you. Mostly very busy right now, teaching online video conferences with clients all day long, really. Um, and, you know, I have a bit of a cold also. Not the bad stuff, I guess, but, you know, still. But mostly I'm okay. Oh, you both are in Vienna. Okay, good. Good, great. Are your families doing okay as well? Okay, so slowly some of the people are joining us. Hey, we are four already. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, my family, they're doing okay. I mean, I'm here together with my wife, you know, uh, only the two of us. We have a, quite a large apartment here in Vienna, so... You know, it's not exactly that we have a problem with space or anything like that. We also have a we also have a, a terrace, so it's okay. It's not like being on the countryside like some people that I know, but still, we're doing fine here. Uh, we're also taking care of my in-laws, you know, who are, who are much older, and of course, we you know we we uh, we do the grocery shopping for them. We cook for them from time to time, but we can't really meet them obviously they have we have to distance ourselves physically from them but i think a lot of people are doing this right now right um okay um well i would say let's get started i'm not sure if other people are going to join us but uh anyway i'm glad that you guys are here uh so i can see james and anna are there any are there Students, any other LBS students here? I can see it says four people. I don't know if I'm one of the four or not. Maybe you have a visitor as well. So hi, visitor, if you're here, you're welcome to, to, to join us as well, of course. It's a public stream. Okay, um, so let's get started then. Um, in our first online class, I gave you guys an overview of consumer behavior. We defined consumer behavior. You might remember we discussed how consumer behavior are the is is into uh, the, the study of consumer behavior is interested in understanding consumers, how they think, how they feel, how they act, when they select products, when they make purchases, when they use them, when they dispose of them. So it's quite a broad field, as you might remember. Last time also, just as a quick review, we also talked about how uh, consumers, how cons um, we also talked about the different perspectives on consumer behavior. As marketers, of course, usually we take the marketer's perspective. So we look at consumer behavior from the point of view of a company trying to influence 
consumer behavior and consumers. But he also said it's quite important and useful to look at consumer behavior from the point of view of the consumers themselves and also from the policymakers' perspectives, from the uh, from the legislators, the judges, the consumer protection agencies, and so on. Thinking about that right now, of course, in this crisis, I mean, this is also very important. Um, if I, if I, you know, every day I get all kinds of, you know, spam mails, you know, trying to trick me and others into into some buying something or 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 even worse, you know, even in a crisis like this, I mean. Consumer protection is particularly important, in my opinion. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> okay, so this is what we did last time. We also, yeah, another thing is we talked about uh, the pitfalls of consumer behavior, this trap you could fall into, and also we discussed the dark side of consumer behavior. But that was our last class. So what's new in this class now? Um, today, uh, we'll talk about... Here it is again, I think I showed you last time. Here is my second brain, my second brain. You can even, you can even take it apart if you, if you like, you know, it exists of different parts. You can look inside the brain, okay, here. Isn't that gorgeous, okay, there you go. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna discuss the different uh, regions of the brain. Uh, we thought that is quite interesting as well different regions and what they do and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but we're going to look into the brain nonetheless, because today we're going to discuss uh, consumer information processing and perception. So we're going to talk about how consumers or how people in general process information in their brains. That's, uh, in my opinion, a really fascinating area. And it's also very, very relevant for consumer behavior and for marketers. So, having said that, uh, let's get started. So, so the topic today is going to be consumer information processing. Um, let me let me give you a brief overview of our agenda. We will look at the consumer information processing model and we will also talk about perception. Perception is really the process. So first we're going to look at information processing kind of as uh, the different, uh, in different stages, the different stages of consumer information processing and then we look at the process itself. So we're going to look at this kind of from, from two different but very, very much related perspectives. So um, <clears throat> let's start with this consumer information processing. Let me, uh, processing model. Let me show you what that, what that is exactly. Um, <clears throat> the, the model goes like this. First of all, you know, we, um, we we're gonna look at what's called the black box model. Maybe some of you have heard of this in uh, other classes, might well be the case. Uh, <clears throat> what's the black box model? The black box model tries to explain uh, or examine human behavior. And according to this black box model, researchers who want to know uh, why people behave in a certain way uh, should focus on the inputs and then the outputs. The inputs, that's everything in our world. The, the inputs are all the stimuli around us. Everything that we see, that we hear, that we smell, that we taste, that we touch, those are the inputs. There are millions and millions of stimuli out there. And <clears throat> through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our skin, and so on, we <clears throat> get these inputs. Um, then there is the organism, the consumer, the brain. And according to this black box model, it's, well, as a matter of fact, a black box. We can't look inside it, according to this model. Um, <clears throat> so we have to focus on the outputs. We can observe, we can directly observe what people do. So we look at the stimuli that are in a certain environment, and we look at the reactions of uh, the people. And uh, so we can say, if there are certain inputs, this leads to a certain 
outputs. Now, this black box model is associated with a certain movement in psychology and the uh, social sciences, which is called behaviorism. Behaviorism um, was very, very pop popular for many decades, up until the 1970s, approximately, I would say, 1970s, 1980s, perhaps still, but mostly, you know, 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, <clears throat> 70s. It was a huge movement in the social sciences. Um, the, the reason why behaviorists uh, looked at people and consumers that way is because before that in psychology, psychology wasn't very scientific, uh, we could say. Uh, psychologists often relied on things like introspection. So they tried to understand people by thinking, hmm, how did I do this? Or what do I th feel right now? What do I uh, what do I think right now and why is that? So that wasn't very methodical, I would say. It was uh, very kind of a very casual form of research in a sense, at least according to what the behaviorists thought. So the behaviorists said, um, um, we need to be more precise. We need to be more objective. So let's focus on what we can observe. We can observe the inputs. We can observe the outputs. What goes inside the mind, since we... Since we can't observe it, let's just not concentrate on that. Let's concentrate on what we can observe. Now, <clears throat> there are some names you may have heard, perhaps um, some famous uh, names in this area. Uh, Watson, famous psychology professor. Skinner, P.F. Skinner. Pavlov, you might remember the experiment with Pavlov's dogs, right? These were all um, uh, scholars who followed this school of thought, this paradigm of uh, behaviorism. Now, however, things have changed then. Starting, I guess, approximately in the 1960s, 1970s, starting then, there was a second, uh, there was kind of what we could call a paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift was a different, a paradigm is basically how you do research, a uh, research paradigm. And this paradigm shift, led to the consume to the information processing model. And according to the information processing model, there are still inputs and outputs that we can observe, but um, most uh, social scientists today would say, yes, we can look inside the, the, the person's mind or the consumer's minds. We may not be able to directly observe what goes on inside the mind. Right? But we can indirectly observe it at least. And it's not unscientific to try to understand what goes on. And this is kind of basic, this is kind of the background, so to say, of what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna follow this information processing model. And by the way, if the black box model interests you, we're gonna come back to that as well, because the black box model, behaviorism is not completely dead. It's still actually marketing petitioners still use that, by the way. So, for example, if uh, a marketing practitioner's, uh, practitioner wants to know what effect does music have on how long people stay in the store, well, they may do a simple experiment where they, where they play music and then observe, you know, what happens. They measure how long people stay in the store or how different music might work. They don't focus on what goes inside the mind. They just say, okay, here's the music and then the input, and then we observe what the output is, how long they stay or how much they spend. So it's not that, and we're going to come back to that when we, in, a, in a future class when we talk about uh, learning. Um, but now, today, we're going to focus on the information processing model. So we, we're going to try as much as we can to look inside the consumer's mind. So um, the consumer information processing model um, is real consumer information processing is the sequence of mental activities that people use in consumption contexts. Now, here's the thing: consumer information processing is not different from any other information processing that people engage in. So a person is not different when he or she is a consumer than when she is not acting as a consumer. Information processing is exactly the same 24 hours a, a day. Um, it's not different in a consumption context, the general, the general processes, that is. However, 
in marketing, we are interested in consumer behavior, obviously. So that's why we call it consumer information processing, because we're interested in the implications that this has for consumer behavior and for marketing. That's why I call it consumer information processing. But uh, again, information processing, uh, whether this is in a consumption context or in some other context that does not involve consumer behavior, and a lot of human behavior is consumer behavior, actually, uh, is exactly the same. So let's look at uh, consumer information processing in more detail. Specifically, there are two parts to that. There is what we call the conceptual system and the sensory system. The sensory system, very simple, are all five senses. Let's see if I can remember them. Okay, hearing, uh, uh, um, eyesight, uh, taste, smell, touch. I think I've, I've mentioned all of them, all right? I hope. Uh, it's all five senses. This is part of information processing. That's kind of where we get the inputs from. And then there is the conceptual system. These are the mental concepts. This is what goes on inside our brain. So we're going we're gonna to look at both of them. <clears throat> so here's now our hypothetical consumer information processing system. What does it look like? In this uh, processing system, we have, uh, first of all, the external world. The external world, that's everything that's around us, all the stimuli that is around us. As I said before, everything that we hear, that we taste, that we smell, that we feel, that we touch, and so on. These are the stimuli, millions and millions of them. And then there is what we call the sensory register. The sensory register, that's basically our five senses. So these are the receptors that we have for hearing, the receptors that we have for tasting, which are located on our tongue, the olfactory bulb, the receptors for, uh, this is where the, the nerves that, that lead to the brain that are responsible for, uh, that allow us to smell and so on. So that's the sensory register. Then we have what's called STM, which stands for short-term memory. And finally, there is long-term memory. So that's the, that's our, that's our, hypothetical uh, consumer information processing system. Why do I call it hypothetical? Well, I call it hypothetical because, you know, this is kind of a, an abstract representation of this system in a sense. Of course, you know, you can look at it from a different perspective as well, you know, from a biological perspective, what goes on in our brain and so on. This is more like a conceptual perspective of what goes on in our brain, <clears throat> okay? So these are, these are the different parts of the system. Now, of course, uh, we can look at these parts in more detail. So first, the sensory register. The sensory register are the five senses that, um, that people use to gather external stimuli. So the five senses, um, uh, the five senses, uh, something important to know about the sensory system is <clears throat> that the sensory impressions are very, very short. So when you see something, this, the, the separate impressions that we have, the separate visual impressions that we have, you know, they are just split seconds uh, and they change constantly. The same thing about hearing, the same thing about smell, and of course also touch. These are very, very short sensor expression, much less than a second. Uh, and that's lots of them. And there are so many sensory impressions. So the, 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 the purpose of the sensory register is really uh, to order, uh, to put order and control in all of these um, uh, sensory impressions. So it's kind of like a buffer, really. It, 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 tries to, it tries to deal with all these sensory impressions that we have and, uh, and kind of um, make a, make a pre-selection of what to, what to further process. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, the sensory register. What about short-term memory? Short-term memory is the part of our brain where thinking occurs. So um, we, we could compare short-term memory to RAM. You know, the computer, we have ROM and we have RAM. Uh, RAM is random access memory. That's basically um, when you use the computer and you use a certain software, 
let's say like PowerPoint or Microsoft Word or anything like that, you first need to load the software into RAM so that you can use it. The software is stored in ROM on your hard disk. But in order to use it, you first need to load it into random access memory. You know, and that's like uh, the working memory of the computer. That's kind of the analogy also to, to our mind. We also have a working memory. Now, the interesting thing is now that short-term memory receives uh, information both from the sensory register and from long-term memory. So from both sides, really. So it's not enough that we just get information through our five senses. We also need to get information <clears throat> from long-term memory. Otherwise, we couldn't make sense of the input that we get from the outside. So short-term memory is really like kind of like the in-between the sensory register and the long-term memory. Another thing that's important to know, and we will get to this point, uh, we will get back to this point in a moment, is that short-term memory has severe capacity limits. So our short-term memory is very, very limited. And perhaps you might remember this from a previous class that you took with me. Uh, so we'll talk about this in a little more detail in this class. But that's short-term memory. Now let's move on to, uh, before we move on to long-term memory, what I'd like to show you is kind of this back and forth between short-term memory, sensory register, and long-term memory. For this, I have an advertisement here. If you look at this ad here, uh, and if you try to read it, you will notice um, you will stop from time to time when you read this for the first time. You might read something like, if you, okay, that's supposed to mean you, there's a carrot, ah, carrot. If you care at all about quality and saving dollars, What's this? Mm, lettuce. Oh, lettuce. Lettuce make your custom uh, <clears throat> caps and emblems. Now, why is it so slow? When you read this for the first time, why, why uh, does this take quite a while to read it? Well, because, you see, you need to interpret what you see here. So you need to interpret this thing up here it's a carrot, and what does that mean? Oh, it sounds like carrot, carrot, okay? Or here, lettuce. So lettuce make your, that makes sense? So it's it's kind of slow, it, you, it's kind of slow because, because you need to load information from long-term memory in order to interpret, in order to make sense of the information that you get through the sensory register, in this case, through your eyes. So this kind of shows you this uh, back and forth between uh, sensory register, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Um, as I said before, uh, short-term memory really has a severe capacity limit. So this is something that you might remember from uh, our previous class. Um, in uh, there was this famous article by George Miller, who already in the 1960s wrote the article, The Magical Number Plus or Minus Two. And in this article, Miller makes a convincing case that we can, we can retain only very few items in short-term memory. He had done kind of like a meta-analysis of different articles that were at the time that were, um, <clears throat> that were analyzing, uh, you know, uh, the short-term memory, and he came to the conclusion that short-term memory can only hold approximately seven, seven items at any time. He called it the magical number seven, plus or minus two, meaning it could be a little more, it could be a little less. As a matter of fact, it seems like mm, we uh, the capacity limit might even be smaller than seven. I mean, newer research showed for many people it might be, or in many situations it might only be around five items, which is not very much, right? I mean, it's clearly, it's clearly very, very limited. Um, and this, of course, has many implications uh, also, also for marketing. Um, <clears throat> now, there are ways around that the brain has, of course, to deal with that. You see, for example, here, if you look at this number here, 1531201993, could you remember it? Probably not. If I just wrote it to you and then I ask you to uh, repeat it to me, 
we most of us would have severe problems remembering all the numbers because look, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items, ten separate numbers. And it's very difficult to retain in short-term memory. But you see, how about this? What if I said 153, 120, 1993? That's easy to uh, remember, right? That's easy to keep in short-term memory because now what we did is we junked. We kind of collected separate items. We grouped them. And now instead of 10 separate items, it's only three, 153, 120, 1993. So this is one of the ways that the mind uh uh, that the mind uses to get away this capacity limitation. Now, <clears throat> short-term memory is very limited, as we said, and we uh, easily forget what's in short-term memory. The question is, uh, why is that actually? You know, why, why, why do we forget? Now, there are different theories about that, uh, and there are some, there is some evidence for both, I would say. One is called the interference theory. The interference the theory states that information, uh, that there is information that competes with information that we are trying to store in memory. So basically, the interference theory says we have some information in short-term memory, and then some new information comes in, and the new information kind of pushes out the old information that's in short-term memory. That's why we forget. The decay theory says that forgetting is uh, because of the passing of time, is, is related to the passing of time. Um, be it as it may, um, <clears throat> what's kind of interesting for us is, of course, uh, how can we remember something? And of course, as marketers, how can we help consumers remember uh, relevant information? Well, what, what you could do is, um, uh, we we could we could help we could re we would remember something better if we rehearse it. Rehearsing means repeating information over and over again to keep it in short term memory. Maybe you've done this before in the past. Uh, uh, think about someone told you a phone number and it took you a moment to write it down. Before you could write it down, uh, you would repeating it five nine three eight seven five nine three eight seven and so on uh, until you had a, a piece of paper and a pen or, or something else to write it down. That's kind of maintenance rehearsal. This is also like when you um, when you uh, memorize something. I remember as a kid, when I was in school, you know, from time to time, we had to memorize some poems. Maybe you had to do that as well. I don't know. Uh, and of course, that's also a repetition, right? So you say the poem once, you say it twice, you say it three times, and so on. So by repeating it, you commit it to memory. That's one form of rehearsal. That's one way to remember something. But there is a second time of uh, rehearsal, and that's called elaborative rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal uh, works even better than maintenance rehearsal. And elaborative rehearsal means to reflect mindfully on the words and their meanings. So instead of just repeating it, uh, you try to make sense of the information. And by making sense, by reflecting on it, by thinking about it, what you do is you connect the new information with information that's already in long-term memory. So by making this connection between the new information and something that is already um, safely stored in long-term memory, uh, you also remember that new information better. So that, um, <clears throat> that of course, helps. That maybe, maybe you have heard that before. Maybe, I don't know, also in school, maybe a teacher's told you that you should try to understand what you study. Now... That's good, and they probably meant it in a different way, but understanding what you study isn't just good because, you know, for intellectual reasons. It's also good simply for remembering it. Because if you try to understand the material, if you try to connect it something that you already know, and that's basically cognitive elaboration, then uh, you also remember it better. That's why, uh, you know, marketers also use this. They try to increase the involvement of consumers because when consumers are more involved, then they think about the information that they get, and they will also remember the brand information, for example, better than when they uh, when they simply you know uh, hear it and or see it and then forget it again.
Now, what stays in short-term memory most easily? What are the things that, uh, that are easy to remember? Well, there is a few more things that we know. Look at this, uh, look at this, these words here, this uh, <clears throat> words, table, cloud, book, tree, and so on. If I read these words to you and then asked you to repeat them to me, what would happen? Well, most people would be able to remember at least the first word here and also the last word. Okay, so this tells us already what uh, stays in short-term memory most easily. If there are several pieces of information in the list, uh, there are two effects. There is what's called the primacy effect. The primacy effect means that words that occur at the beginning of a list are remembered better, and also the recency effect. Words that occur at the end of a list are also remembered better. What's in the middle, we, we forget more easily. Now, you may wonder, what, what are the implications of this? Well, there are several implications to just tell you two of them for marketing. One of them is for marketing research. So perhaps you remember, you have fond memories of our marketing research class. In marketing research class, uh, we talked about surveys. And in surveys, very frequently, we use questions where there are several answer choices, right? Those closed questions. Um, so, for example, you may have a question, uh, which of the following soft drinks do you know? And then you read a list of different soft drink brands to the respondent. Uh, the tricky thing is now we know from research, we know from studies that people will overstate the first brand that you mention in the list and also the last brand that you list, mention in the list simply because of the primacy and the recency effect. So what do marketing researchers do? Um, a good practice is actually to change the order of the list. So every respondent gets a different order. With the first respondent, you start with the first brand, and then you continue. With the second respondent, you start with the second brand, and so on. Of course, if you use an online system or a computer-aided telephone interviewing or anything like that, uh, it does it automatically for you or for the, for the interviewer, I should say. So this is one way how we try to kind of not have the primacy and the recency effect. To talk about another uh, implication, uh, think about television commercials. And in a commercial, you have several arguments. Let's say you have, um, uh, you promote a certain brand and your main, you know, there's one argument that is particularly important. This is your main argument. Now, where would you put it? Uh, Tell me, guys, uh, use, the, use the chat for this, please. Your main argument, the best argument that you have, where would you put it? Would you put it at the beginning? Would you put it in the middle of the commercial? Or would you put it at the end of the commercial? What do you think? Let me know in the chat. And uh, let's see. James, you're guessing at the end. It's mm -hmm. it's a good guess, yeah. Uh, well, look, here's the thing. Uh, you also said Anna also said at the end, okay. Um, yeah. Look, you can put it at the end. You could also make a case for putting it at the beginning. That's also possible, but definitely not in the middle. If you uh, use other arguments at the beginning, at the end, and put it in the middle, people will forget that. It should be either at the beginning or at the end. I mean, you, one could even make an argument maybe that you sh you, you show it twice or you talk, use that argument twice, perhaps. In certain cases, that might be possible. Uh, <clears throat> but don't put it in the middle. It will be forgotten. You know, when you guys make presentations, class presentations, for example, also make sure that you have a really good uh, that you have a really good introduction and you have a really good conclusion of your presentation. Because again, this is what people will remember. Whatever is in the middle, you know, people won't remember that well. Primacy and recency effects. Okay. Um, So, um, is that that before? I th yeah, we, 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 let's now talk about long-term memory, okay? Long-term memory. Um, long-term memory is kind of the storage center of our mind. 
So if you think about it, long-term memory is like the hard disk on your computer. Um, so this is where we store information, not just for a very, very short, very brief period of time, like short-term memory. In short-term memory, something is stored maybe just for a couple of seconds, right? Uh, but in long-term memory, we store information that perhaps for years and years and years to come. Um, <clears throat> and um, so it's, it's, it's the hard disk, if you will, the ROM, the read-only memory. It's, it's where we keep our memories of our past experiences. Now, it's nice to compare the human mind to a computer, right? So we say the short-term memory, that's like the working memory on the computer, the sensory register, what would that be? Well, I guess it would be our input devices like our mouse or a scanner or a webcam. That would be the sensory register, right? Long-term memory, we say, is the, is the, um, is the hard disk, but there is, there are, of course, it's not exactly the same. And one of the, the differences is that while a hard disk is limited, it has a certain capacity, long-term memory, fortunately, does not have capacity limits. So we can store more and more information in long-term memory, which is, which is a good thing, right? Just imagine for a moment if our long-term memory had capacity limits like a hard disk, it would mean that at some point, stop. You know, we, we couldn't learn any new things because it's full. That would be horrible, right? But it's not like that. We can expand over, over our lifespan, we can definitely, and we do expand our, our long-term memory, which is not to say that we that we never uh, that we never forget anything. Of course, we forget things. Not everything things are not 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 everything is stored forever. Uh, but you know, we can uh, we can expand long-term memory. We can have more more and more memories. It's 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 not limited like the hard disk of a computer. Um, also, a long-term memory is organized as a network. So there are different concepts that we store in a, in a network fashion in our long-term memory. You can see that here. So here you can see such an associative network. Uh, let's say there is the, the concept vacation. And this is just the network organization of, of one person, right? Yours, yours might be completely different. Mine might be completely different. This one actually was the association of one of my research assistants uh, who, uh, <coughs> who, who when, when I ask her, you know, to draw uh, to, to our associative network, this is what, or for vacation, this is what, what she came up at the time. So she, in her mind, you know, she associated vacation with Paris, with sun, with beach, with a cruise ship, with foreign languages. So these concepts, right, are all concepts that are close to uh, the concept vacation the ones that you can see here. Then of course, you know, thinking of cruise ship, there are other associations that you had. You thought of Love Boat, that's a TV show, right? Then Titanic, Love Boat, Playboy, then she thought of the magazine. Vacation, she also thought of water, and when she thought of water, she thought of thirsty. Vacation meant beach, she thought of love, <laughs> and the deck chair, and of course also sun. Um, so this is kind of how we store information. This is kind of how we how we store information in a long-term memory in an associative network. Um, and if we want to retrieve information, then of course we need you know we need to activate these knots in long-term memory uh, to retrieve that information. What is closer? What is closer with the knots that are closer to a specific other knot, like the knots that are the concepts that are closer to the to the concept vacation. This is also what is associated most and this is what we will retrieve more easily when we think of that concept vacation. Um, <clears throat> well when we when we commit something to long-term memory we call this uh, encoding. So encoding is really the categorization of stimuli. And by doing this, we would also choose a storage location for it in long-term memory. Uh, now, obviously, we don't do this consciously, but uh, we still, we, we would kind of um, store the information. We would kind of store concepts close to other concepts that are, that are similar. Now, what, does, what are the implications for a marketer? For a marketer, the implication is, is that we should try to place 
uh, the brand in the customer's evoked set. The evoked set uh, is a marketing term, and it means um, the, um, the brands that come to mind when a, a consumer thinks of a specific product category. So, for example, a consumer says, mm, I need to buy a good soap. And the brands that come to mind, they're in that consumer's evoked set. And obviously, for a marketer, we would want to be in the, the evoked set because that would help us sell our brand. Of course, you know, we could also, you, in addition to that, we can take other approaches as well. So, for example, in the supermarket or in the, in the, in the uh, drugstore, you know, we make sure that we have a product display with our soap so that even if the brand was not that the consumers evoked sets, when they see it, they may, be, they, they, they may be exposed to the brand. But of course, it would help if people, when they think, mm, a good soap, they, ah, okay, our brand is in that evoked set. So, and it is in the evoked set when when the uh, when 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 the brand name or the brand is stored close to a good soap. Okay, um, now how do we retrieve information from long-term memory? First of all, retrieval means locating knots in, in long-term memory and bringing them into short-term memory. Because remember, for the thinking occurs in short-term memory. So we need to kind of locate the knot first in long-term memory and then kind of put it in short-term memory so, so we, can, we can think about it. Now, what helps with this, what helps with retrieval are so-called external retrieval cues. Uh, <clears throat> so marketers obviously want to use these external retrieval cues so that consumers remember their brands and the brand information also. And an external retrieval cue is a stimulus that activates information that is relevant for the information that should be, should be remembered. Sounds a bit complicated, right? But let me show you an example. It's actually quite simple. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of such an external retrieval cue. Um, here you have batteries, energizer. You may also know them by the name Duracell, right? And um, the, the, this, this brand, Energizer or Duracell, they have, um, for many years, they have had television commercials where they use this Energizer or Duracell bunny. Maybe some of you know it. Uh, this bunny is, 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 is going, walking and walking and walking and, you know, drumming. Uh, and it goes on forever and ever and ever. It never stops. That's the kind of idea you, that the brand wants consumers to have in their minds when they think of, when they think of that brand. Um, it should, it's the battery that lasts the longest, seemingly forever, right? So this is kind of what the, the, uh, the, the idea that the marketer tries to put in our mind about the brand. So this is what we see on, in television commercials. The thing is now, um, when the consumer is in the supermarket or in the do-it-yourself store or wherever you buy your batteries, um, obviously the brand would like us to remember that information, that this brand is the brand that lasts forever, seemingly. Now, how is this done? Well, look at this. Look at the packaging. If you look carefully, you will see that on the packaging, there is the bunny, right? And this is an external retrieval cue because um, when, when you go to the store, you might not think of that information or you might not remember which brand is the one that, that, that is longest lasting. Well, but when you see the packaging here, you, you see that cue, you see this visual cue in this case, and then you remember. So this helps the consumer retrieve the information from long-term memory. Now, a retrieval cue could be a brand character like here, but it could also be something completely different. It could just be a color maybe, or it could be a scent, or it could be a logo, or it could be a slogan. There are many retrieval cues that could be used. Um, <clears throat> so what is uh, so what is some of the uh, what is some of the information that we um, that we uh, excuse me what is some of the um, ways we can 
help uh, customers remember. First of all, let's not forget, greater rehearsal leads to stronger memories. So one thing we could do is we could uh, help consumers remember brand information by repeating that information. This is exactly what advertising does. So if you think about commercials, a commercial is not usually, it's usually not just shown one time, but it's shown many times. And the reason for that is because it does take several times for consumers to remember. If you show the commercial only once, uh, most likely people won't remember. So rehearsal, right? Uh, repetition. Um, it's also interesting to know that learning grows with additional exposure, but at a diminishing rate. So for example, when you show that commercial, if you show a commercial three times instead of two, people will remember better. If you show it four times instead of three, people will remember even better. If you show it five times instead of four, consumers will remember even better, and so on. So the more that you show it, the better they will remember. However, the additional gain in, uh, in memory, so to say, or uh, is, 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 is diminishing. So showing a commercial 10, time is, 10 times is, is great. If people will remember it better. Showing it 20 times, they will remember it better. But the additional, the additional effect uh, diminishes. That's like when you, know, when, you, when you study for an exam, you read the book once. That's probably not enough. If you read the chapters twice, that's better. If you read it three times, it's even better. The more time you read it, the better you're going to remember it. But the 20th time you read it, you know, compared to the 19th time, you get some effect, additional effect, but not that much. That's what I mean by diminishing rate. Um, we also know that effectiveness is enhanced when repetitions are spread out. So, for example, for advertising, it's, it works better, at least it's remembered better, if it's not shown in a very, very short sequence, one of the, the other, but if there is some time in between. This, by the way, also works for you when you, uh, when you study for an exam. So think, for example, you study a language. I know that you guys are studying languages. And I'm sure your language te teachers have told you it's better if, uh, <clears throat> if, if, you, if, you, if you spread it out. So if you study a little bit every day instead of studying uh, just, uh, you know, let's say in the extreme, every two weeks uh, for, for a whole day, the effect is going to be greater. So if you spread out the repetition, it works better than when it's more when it's more blocked when it's more concentrated. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in in the, in the case of advertising, we could also use what's called uh, uh, different ad advertising executions because if you show exactly the same uh, commercial again and again and again, uh, people will get bored or consumers might get annoyed by if you do this. So that's why advertisers use maybe some different executions. The message stays the same but it's presented in a little bit of a different way. Uh, another thing you can do to help uh, consumers remember is you could refer to dual coding theory. You guys are lucky because you heard that before in a previous class, uh, in our shopper marketing class. Dual coding theory uh, works like this, just as a so to help you remember now. Dual coding means that information in long-term memory can be stored both semantically and visually. So we have two different systems for storing information. We have, we have a semantic system in our mind, which stores information as words, as language. And we have a visual system, which stores information as pictures. And people remember best when uh, they use both forms of representation. So as a marketer, you should encourage both forms of representation. So one example, and we talked about different ones uh, last semester, but one example to give you a new one is you could use uh, visual representations of brand names. Look at these brand names here. We have Jack's Camera Shop. And you see, it's the name Jack's Camera Shop. But you also have the picture here, which is like from a playing card. It's the Jack. And the Jack has a, has a camera, right? So people can store this as, as the name uh, uh, verbally, um, semantically. But of course, also that picture of, of Jack. Or the next one, arrow pest control. Well, there is the name, but you can also see the bug here and the arrow that kind of crushes the poor bug, you know, poor, poor virus, so to say, right? 
<clears throat> um, that's what we mean by dual uh, coding theory. Again, we, we should present information, not just verbally, but also visually. Then will people will remember better. What else can you do to help people and help consumers remember? Uh, another way to do it is to use mostly concrete words. Concrete words that have like um, a representation in the real world are easier to remember than abstract words. So something like dog or tree or brain or class or bird, right? These, these are things that we can visualize. They're kind of concrete. Something like equality, coherence, satisfaction. These words, you know, are abstract concepts. They are much more difficult to remember. I'm not saying we couldn't use these words. Of course, we need to use these words, particularly in an academic context. We use these abstract words a lot because not everything is concrete, right? But in marketing, it's generally better to use concrete words than abstract words because, first of all, they're more easily understood, and secondly, they're also more easily remembered. Obviously, stimuli that are distinctive, that are unique, that uh, look different or uh, sound different or smell different or something like that, okay, these stimuli are easy to, easier to remember than stimuli that are very similar to others. Finally, of course, another thing you could do is you could also use symbols. So symbolic information uh, helps as well. Uh, what's a symbol? Well, a symbol is a, is a picture or a number or any kind of sign, any kind of sign that stands for something else. You know, for example, a pumpkin is a symbol for Halloween. Um, <clears throat> or uh, here. Well, let me show you this um, here, the bunny, right? That's a symbol for Easter, okay? So that's what we mean by using symbols. Uh, <clears throat> so that also helps people remember. Okay, I've given you an overview of the general consumer information processing system. At this point, uh, you guys who are, who are here, uh, um, do you guys have any questions? Is there anything that I can answer for you, what we have covered so far? Anything that I've uh, explained that you want me to explain in a different way, maybe, or you want another example or something like this? No? Okay, good. In that case, um, let's, let, okay. In that case, let's uh, move on. And let's talk about perception, which is, of course, closely related to the consumer information processing because perception takes place in that consumer information processing system. Um, so let's first define perception, what we mean by perception. Now, perception can be defined as the process of sensing, selecting and interpreting stimuli in the external world. So basically, perception is about translating the external world, that's everything that surrounds us, into our internal world. You know, inside what's happening inside our brain. And for this, you know, we need first need to sense the stimuli through our sensory system. Then we need to select stimuli. We need to select which stimuli we will further process because we can't process all of the stimuli, obviously. And then we need to make sense of them. We need to interpret them. All of that, all of that is happening inside our brain. So uh, let's talk about uh, um, perception in more detail. Now, there are two key factors in perception. Right? So what we perceive and how we perceive it 
depends, first of all, on stimulus characteristics. That means um, the, the size of a stimuli. A stimulus. Is it, is it a big stimulus? Is it a small stimulus? The color of the stimulus. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 all, the characteristics of the stimuli, is, stimulus basically influence how we will process that stimulus. You know, there are many, many, there are many, many stimuli. Colors, volumes, design, music, photos, story, uh, people. All of these are stimuli that we, that we, that we process. And how we process them depends on the stimulus, first of all. But perception does not only depend on the stimulus. Perception also depends on consumer characteristics. So different consumers or different people will also process stimuli differently. Okay, so if you want to try it, if you want to try to understand perception, we need to focus on stimuli and we need to focus on uh, the person as well. So here is again our consumer information processing system, just as a review, right? The external world of stimuli, the sensory register, the short term memory and long-term memory. Now, uh, in, all of these, uh, in all of these different um, systems, does uh, perception take place? You can see that here, there are different stages in perception. The first stage in perception is called sensing. Sensing occurs, you, you can see this here on the left, Sensing takes place in the sensory register, where this little asterisk is here, here, right? So that's where sensing takes place. Sensory register, <clears throat> this is where we sense the information. Of course, we already need <coughs> some input from uh, short-term memory to kind, of, uh, to, kind of, um, to kind of control this sensing or to, uh, to kind of manage the sensing, but it takes place in the sensory register our five senses. Then the next step is called selecting and attending. Selecting and attending is about which stimuli we further process and which stimuli we don't further process. And for this, you know, this takes place in the uh, in short-term memory and uh, also in the sensory register. So here it's like the collaboration of short-term memory and long-term memory. Of course, for that, we also already need some, some input from uh, long-term memory. And the last stage in uh, the perceptual process is interpretation. And interpretation, uh, for this, we uh, need a lot of information from long-term memory. Um, because without information from long-term memory, we really can't make much sense of what the stimuli really means for us because that depends very much on the previous information that we have or previous experiences and so on. So we will look at these uh, three stages now, sensing, selecting and attending and interpretation. So we'll start with the first stage of course, which is sensing, the sen which takes place in the sensory register, right? Here are sensory receptors, you all know them the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the nose, the skin. So all five senses really. Again, in our previous class, we've already learned a lot about these five senses, but let's just uh, talk about a few things. The first one is vision, right? Uh, there's so much to say about vision, obviously. Um, and we talked about that in, uh, in shopper, shopper marketing before. Um, we talked about the symbolic meaning of colors, right? How different colors, depending on the, the culture, have, have different meanings. We also talked about biological color effects, right? Um, we, 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 we talked already before how different colors capture our attention. For example, we know that saturated colors uh, are better to capture attention than uh, other colors. We could discuss how uh, color is also used to identify brands. So just look at the Starbucks logo, right? The, the, the dark green is associated with Starbucks. Uh, um, color also helps uh, consumers in their choice. So for example, if you think of sweeteners, uh, have a look here, here I have different, you have different sweeteners. I hold them in the camera, right? I have different sweeteners here and uh, 
people. These are from these are from the United States, and in the U.S., people uh, <clears throat> know exactly the sweetener that they like that they want to use. You know, some people want to use Equal, others use um, uh, others uh, use uh, sucralose, others use saccharin, which the brand name is uh, Sweet and Low, and depending. Uh, depending on what they want, when they are, let's say, in a coffee shop or in a restaurant, right? And there, there are the different sweetness there. Uh, then they don't need to think about which is which because they already know the color. Because they know that equal, which is aspartame, is always blue. Okay, sucralose is always is always uh, yellow. Is always yellow. Um, as, uh, um, saccharin. Sweet and low is always pink. Sugar itself comes in a white package. And you know, there's also stevia, the, which it comes in a green package. So clearly the color signals uh, which which is which. And it does it in a very, very fast. So it doesn't take much time to uh, for people to, to think about it because we can process colors very, very quickly. Okay, um, another uh, interesting aspect we could talk about is uh, color blindness. You know, uh, there are some people who can't distinguish, distinguish uh, very well between different colors. Uh, they have a problem distinguishing between certain colors. Now, there are different types or different kinds of color blindness, uh, and, so, and most of them are very, very rare. Very few people have them. But there is one color blindness uh, that is more widespread, and this is uh, red white color blindness. Red white color blindness is, um, is, is, is only occurring among men. So it only, it only, it only affects the male population. So women don't have that color blindness. It's genetic, obviously. It's a gen which kind of makes sense then, right? It's genetic. Um, and uh, there are some guys who can't distinguish uh, very, wrong, very well between green and red. Now, if you look at this uh, picture that I showed you here, um, you can try if you can uh, see the numbers. Can you? Can you tell me what the numbers what the what the numbers are? What's the number that's shown there? Yes, it's seventy four exactly. It's seventy four, right? I mean, Anna and Sophie, you shouldn't have a problem, right? Because obviously, right? Uh, yes, James. You see now, okay, you're not colorblind either. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> now, most most guys are not colorblind, obviously, um, but about about I think about five or six percent of the male population have it. So you say that's small, but think about it. You take of uh, the population of a country. I mean, millions and millions of people. You know, it's not that small after all, right? So for marketers, obviously, the implication is that on packages, for example. We should make sure that we don't print green on red or red on green because it will make it harder for some people to read that. In case you wonder uh, if someone is colorblind, if someone has the red green color blindness, how do they um, how do they drive? How do they see the red light? Right. Well, it's not a problem because uh, you know the red and the green uh, light and the yellow light or orange light uh, they're always in the same they're always in the same order. And also, it's the intensity of the light. So even if you have a problem distinguishing between green and red, still, when you drive, uh, you, you you can manage. It's not that big of a deal, really. But on the package, you know, when it's small print and then even, you know, red and green mixed, that's not a good idea. So be considered. Let's move on to smell. Um, that's also some uh, smell or this, the olfaction is already a sense that we talked about also in our previous class. We talked about uh, the sense of smell in, in, shop, in, in shopper marketing, of course, with regards to um, 
the scented stores, right? How you can use an ambient scent in the store. So I won't go into much detail on this now because we really talked a lot about that. Um, but of course you can also scent not just stores, but also uh, products. There are scented cars, scented airplanes, household products of course are scented, right? Cosmetics are scented. They even scented advertisements. Maybe you know the scratch and sniff advertisements uh, where you scratch them, you know, you can smell uh, the, the scent. They, they often do this for perfumes, of course, and so on. Uh, the key thing, if you remember from our previous class where I told you some personal anecdotes about it as well is that odors can trigger emotions. Um, so if you want to emotionally influence consumers, uh, scents are a very good way of doing that. And you also learned in our previous class that congruent scents uh, have the most positive effect. So scents that fit the store or scents that fit the product. So it's important that the scent is not just a nice smell, a nice scent, uh, but it's also something that is fitting, that fits the product or fits the store. Um, another sensory perception is obviously sound, right? Here we talk, again, we talked about that as well in Shopper Marketing, and here we talk primarily about um, background music in the store. You guys, I'm sure you remember functional music. It's a form of functional music. Music is music that has a job, music that is not just played for amusement uh, or for artistic value, but because we want this music to create a certain effect on people like uh, chamber music, remember in the old days, uh, elevator music, so people don't feel claustrophobic, the music that's on the hold line on the, uh, on the phone when we have to wait, so we realized that we were not disconnected and so on. Uh, in addition to the background music, of course, we have advertising jingles to create brand awareness, um, and so on. Uh, notice there is also what's called sound engineering, so, more and more products are sound engineered. So um, the marketer thinks specifically what kind of sound the product should make. A uh, typical example for that would be the car makers. They fine tune the sound of the engine, they fine tune the, the sound of the door when you slam it and so on. Um, but even snacks, there are snacks like Pringles that were sound engineered. So when you open the package, the pop that it makes and things like that. So quite a fascinating field as well. So sound isn't just music. Um, we focused on that in our previous class, but of course there can be other uses of sound as well. Touch. Um, there is, interesting enough, there is relatively little research on touch, I mean, uh, compa at least compared to the other senses. We know a lot about the visual sense. This is probably the sense that we know the most about in marketing. Uh, not probably, definitely, we know the most about visuals, the visual sense, because that's also uh, the most important sense for humans. Um, we know we, in the last couple of years, we learned a lot about uh, uh, how uh, uh, scents and smells uh, can be used in marketing. Uh, we know a lot about music and sounds, but touch is a bit under-researched still. But of course, you know, uh, it can also have effect on effects on consumer behavior. So for example, we know that customers that are lightly touched by a waitress in a casual restaurant give bigger tips. So when the waitress comes and lightly touches the customer, this leads to a bigger tip. Now, of course, this is this was done in American context, and this may not be the same in every culture. It's also not the same for every type of restaurant. So for an elegant restaurant, an upscale restaurant, this wouldn't be appropriate. But you know, more like a casual pop kind of restaurant, uh, this 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 seems to work. Also, uh, customers were lightly touched by food demonstrators in a supermarket were also more likely to try a new snack product. You know, the food demonstrators you have in the supermarkets, uh, they try to say, or they ask you if you want to try a new product, they lightly touch the customer. Again, in the American context, this uh, led to more people trying the product. And of course, also people associate uh, touch with uh, product quality. 
Uh, there were studies done with regards to fabrics and depending on the touch of the fabric, people would say, oh, this is, a, this is an upscale fabric. Uh, this is a very uh, high quality fabric or this is a cheaper fabric. Um, yeah, the perceived richness uh, of material in clothing is linked to feel. So whether the, when, the, when the fabric is rough, then people would say, oh, this is kind of like a cheaper fabric. When it's a smooth feel, they would say, okay, this is a more uh, exclusive, elegant, upscale fabric. Interestingly enough, with regards to the fabric in the study, if the fabric was light, people, consumers would associate it with uh, women. If the fabric was heavier, they would associate it with uh, men. Yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to taste now. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see the taste perceptions. Where, how do we taste? Well, uh, basically, uh, taste, uh, we taste through our tongue. Uh, we have taste perceptors on our tongue. And interestingly enough, we don't, we don't have that many tastes. You see, you can see them here. Basically, the taste that we have is bitter, sour, salty, sweet, and one more, which is umami. Now, I don't think I have to explain what bitter, sour, salty, or sweet is. Um, <clears throat> but what is umami? Well, umami is, uh, we have taste receptors for this umami taste. And umami is kind of a savory taste. It's the taste of monosodium glutamate. And this umami, um, for example, you find that in meat. You find it in mushrooms. You find it in truffles. Um, so the savory taste is another is another uh, taste that we have taste receptors for. Uh, it's a strange name because you know all the other senses they were discovered hundreds or thousands of years ago, I guess. But this umami taste, at least you know in Western cultures, was not uh, was not explicitly described as such. So when researchers found that, uh, I don't know. Uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, I think it was uh, Asian researchers, um, possibly Japanese researchers. I'm not sure about that. So they gave this this uh, this 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 name here, this which sounds a bit strange. Uh, notice that um, it's a bit surprising, perhaps, to some of you that uh, we only have uh, these what bitter, sour, salty, sweet, uh, and umami, five different tastes. We say, how is that possible? When I eat food, you know, uh, it's much more subtle. Well, here's the thing. Uh, when you eat food, still, the, the taste as a, as a sense, it's only these five, because we only have these five receptors for it. But, of course, we experience much, much more, and that is actually, the, uh, this is actually the sense of smell. Because when we say something tastes good, what we really mean is it tastes and smells good. Because we, we process this, the, the smell together with, with the taste. And the smell, of course, the receptors are not on the tongue, but they are in our nose. Um, and when we eat something, uh, you know, both the smell receptors and the taste receptors are activated. And this is how, how we have, you know, how we can, we would say, okay, this is a very subtle taste of this and that because it's this connection of taste and smell. Um, another thing that <coughs> that is kind of interesting is maybe you've heard that people would say, oh, this leaves a bitter aftertaste. I mean, they use this figuratively, but they also, you know, use it literally. And it's actually true, bitter aftertaste, because look, uh, can you see that the, that the receptors for bitter they're mostly, con they are mostly concentrated at the back of the tongue. That's why we have the bitter aftertaste. Uh, only later, further down or further back on the tongue, this is where bitter is. Now, not entirely. It's not like, you know, sour is only on the side and sweet is only on the tip of the tongue and bitter is only at the back. There are there are also, there are also receptors all over the tongue for these um, um, tastes. But there are certain concentrations on the tongue. And this is why we have this bitter aftertaste. Uh, another thing that I would like to point out is that uh, <clears throat> changes in culture also determine the taste we find desirable. So for marketers, um, where culture comes in the most is really with regards to taste. So people in different countries, people of different cultures have very different tastes in the sense that what they have very different taste preferences. 
Um, I to give you an example, um, I remember um, a couple uh, some time ago. I watched uh, I watched a documentary on BBC. And this documentary was about was about taste, and they researched two groups of people. They they had one group of people which were uh, traditional English people. Okay. The other group of people that they researched was a group of um, um, Chinese immigrants to the UK, and so they had the, they did this little experiment. I mean, for the for the documentary with these two groups of people, uh, they gave them two different uh, two different dishes to eat. The two dishes were number one Stilton cheese, which is a very traditional English cheese. Uh, Stilton is a blue cheese. Uh, and it has a very, very strong, pungent taste. But, you know, uh, traditionally people in Britain love it. I'm sure not everyone does, but, you know, it's a very traditional food, really. It's a little bit like Stilton is kind of a little bit like Gorgonzola or Rock 4 or something like that. So very, very strong uh, taste and smell also. Um, the second dish was a, a traditional Chinese dish. It's called a thousand-year-old eggs. And these thousand-year-old eggs, are kind of, they're not a thousand years old, but these are eggs that are preserved. What you do is you preserve them, I, I, you, you preserve them in potassium or something like this, and you leave them to ferment for a couple of weeks, I think. And after a couple of weeks, the eggs, uh, they don't spoil obviously, because otherwise you couldn't eat them, right? But they kind of turn uh, brown, very dark brown, black kind of. Um, and this is, yes, James, yes, Stilton, you love Stilton, good. James, uh, being in one of those two groups, do you also love, do you also love thousand-year-old eggs? Have you ever tried them or would you try them? Let's hear from you. Does that sound good for you? The thousand year old eggs? Sounds horrible. Okay. You want to stick with the cheese? Okay. <laughs> yes, I can. That's, exa that's exactly what happened. Look, the British people, they love their Stilton cheese. But when they were given the 1,000-year-old eggs, they reacted like you. Uh, they didn't know. Horrible. How can anyone eat that? That's completely disgusting. Rotten eggs. You should eat rotten eggs, right? But here's another thing. The Chinese immigrants, they loved their 1,000-year-old eggs. And then they were given, you guessed it, right? They were given Stilton cheese. Can you imagine how they reacted? Yes, exactly like the Brits reacted to the thousand-year-old eggs. They said, horrible, horrible. How can anyone eat such a thing? It's disgusting. It's rotten. It stinks, right? So, so basically, uh, this kind of showed very vividly. I, I, really I really loved that documentary. It really showed very vividly how our culture influences our taste perception or our interpretation of the taste we should say so um so what's good and what's bad is very much culturally determined um another example of that might be uh think about this do you like olives yes if you do well i also lo love olives but i remember as a little kid i didn't like them because if you if you think about it, a lot of olives have a little bit of a bitter taste. But you see, it, again, it's an acquired taste. It's 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 so the interpretation of that taste is very much influenced by culture. Of course, that's also for the other senses. The sense of, of smell, also you know, pleasant sense. Sure, there are certain scents that a lot of people would feel uh, pleasant. It's less so than with 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 taste with. Uh, with, with, with taste, food tastes, for example, but also, you know, uh, whether you like a particular perfume may also depend on uh, <clears throat> your culture, your upbringing, your previous experiences and so on. 
Okay, so implications for marketers is that if you're a food marketer, you know, you need to take culture into consideration. It's a very, very important. It's one of the areas where, you know, globalism really hasn't, hasn't changed that much of it. Some, but not that much. Okay, um, let's now move on uh, to a different topic, which is psychophysics. Psychophysics, um, what, what, exact, what exactly is uh, psychophysics? Um, well, let me show you. Uh, psychophysics is uh, basically the science that studies how the physical environment is translated into our personal psychological environment. Um, what does that mean exactly? Well, in psychophysics, um, there. Are, let me first tell you a couple of um, a couple of terms that you need to know. Here, are important terms in psychophysics. A very important uh, term in psychophysics is the term threshold. A threshold is the level at which an effect begins to occur. So um, <clears throat> there is. We have to distinguish between the absolute threshold and the differential threshold. The absolute Threshold is the minimum amount that a person can detect. So look at this picture here. There is this, uh, there is this candle, right? Imagine for a moment you're in a dark room. It's a very, very large room, okay? And a friend of yours um, has a candle, and he is at this very, very large room. Uh, he's at the other end of the room. He's so far away that you can't see the candle because it's completely dark. And yes, he has the candle, but since he's so far away, you won't notice, you won't notice the candle, you won't notice the light. Now your, your friend moves closer and closer, okay? And at some point, you're gonna notice the light. You're gonna notice that he's holding this candle because you see this tiny flicker of light, really. That is the absolute threshold. So that's the minimum amount that can be detected. Um, so this is not just for light, this is also for any other type of uh, stimulus. I could also give you another example. Let's say uh, there's, uh, there's a jug of water and I put some sugar in this water, okay? How much sugar do, you, do I need to put into the water so that you will notice that there is sugar in the water, right? That amount, that's the absolute threshold. By the way, if you wonder, the absolute threshold is not exactly the same for everyone. We have some variations here. You can imagine like with, with, with vision, for example, right? Some people are very, very good vision. They might see the light earlier. Others might see it a little later, perhaps. And the absolute threshold, the precise definition is when 50% of, uh, of a certain population recognize that stimulus. That's the absolute threshold. You know, so in psychophysics is, you know, studies things like, okay, where is the absolute threshold for, 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 for certain, for certain stimuli? So that's the absolute threshold. Um, what's the differential threshold? Well, the, the differential threshold is the minimum amount of change that can be detected. So it's not about uh, how strong a stimulus needs to be so it can be detected. It's more about, it's, it, instead, it's um, how much do we need to change a stimulus so that uh, people can detect that change. The differential threshold is also called the JND or just noticeable, uh, just noticeable difference. Um, <clears throat> let me show you how that works. It, uh, we know exactly um, how much change is needed because there was a psychologist by the name of Weber and Mr. Weber kind of um, found, found out what, the, what, what this relationship, so to say, is between the intensity of the stimulus and, and uh, its detection. And according to Mr. Weber, there's what's called Weber's law, okay? According to Weber's law, the amount of change that is necessary to be noticed is systematically related to the intensity of the original stimulus. Specifically, the stronger the or initial original stimulus is, the greater a change must there be for it to be noticed. 
And there's also a formula for that where it says just noticeable difference is k times i. k is a certain constant that differs for the type, specific type of stimulus because the stimulus is not the same thing with length, loudness, brightness, taste, and so on. Uh, it's not always the same. Uh, it's slightly different, but the, basically this, um, this, 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 uh, this constant here isn't that important really. What's more important is actually the I, which is the intensity of the stimulus, stimulus were uh, the initial stimulus. In that, so to put it in different words, whether a person notices it a change depends on how intensive the specific stimulus is. So let me show you, um, let me give you a specific example of that because maybe it's a bit confusing when we discuss it um, theoretically, but I think it's very easy to grasp when you see a, a, a real world application. So for example, let's assume I have um, I have uh, on my hand, okay. On my hand, I have uh, this piece of paper here. And then, this, so basically the, the, uh, the stimulus we're talking about is weight, okay? I can, I can feel the weight of it. It's very, very light, right? But I can feel the weight in it. Now I put another piece of paper on top. Do I notice the difference? Yes, I notice the difference. I notice the difference. Now on the other hand, I have a different stimulus. Which is much, which is much heavier. Okay, this book here, and now I put another, another uh, piece of paper on it. Do I notice the difference? No, I don't notice the difference. You see, because the initial stimulus is heavy, is strong, and then the additional the, the the since the original stimulus is strong, when I add something to it, the change I won't notice. But again, if the initial stimulus is uh, <clears throat> is very weak, then I do notice the difference in weight. And that's not just for weight, that's also for taste, that's also for loudness and so on. So again, like let's take the let's take the example again with the uh, the jug full of water with the sugar. Uh, if I give you sugar and water and I put a lot of sugar in there and then I add a little more sugar, let's say one 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 teaspoon, you won't notice. You won't notice the difference because the water is already very sugary. On the other hand, where there is just a tiny little bit of sugar in that water, and then I put the full teaspoon in it, you're gonna taste the difference. So that's what Weber's law means. The initial stimulus largely determines whether uh, how much change there needs to be for it to be detected. Now you might wonder what implications that have for marketing. Well, as a matter of fact, there. There are important implications for this. And specifically, the implications are uh, twofold. Sometimes marketers want the change to be, um, to be noticed, and sometimes they don't want the change to be noticed. So for example, you know, um, when, uh, when oops, uh, sometimes when we want the change to be noticed, that would be if we say, we now you get something extra. We put more in our package, okay, and it's free. Now in that case, we definitely want to make sure that uh, consumers notice that change, okay. Um, but more frequently, actually, what marketers do is they use what's called downsizing. Downsizing means that the marketer decreases the contents or ingredients in the product in order to maintain a constant price. And we see this all the time, okay? So let's say here you can see this box of uh, disinfecting wipes, right? And if we downsized it, um, right now it says there are 35, there are 35 uh, disinfecting wipes in there, okay? Now maybe instead of 35, I only to put 32 in there, but I keep the price the same. Why would marketers do this? Well, because of price elasticity of demand. Price elasticity of demand, you know, if, if the prices are very elastic, if you raise the price, uh, then demand would go down by more than what you raise the price really. Now, marketers know this, of course, so often they try 
to uh, keep the price the same, but since their own costs went up, they put in a little less. So this happens with shampoo, with deodorants, with coffee, with disinfecting wipes, with many, many products. Um, now, of course, uh, just to be clear, um, you have to write on the package, you know, uh, the weight of the the weight of the product or the the count, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can't obviously, if you if you put less in than what you write on the package, that's obviously fraud, uh, very serious consequences. Um, so you can't do that. Of course, if you reduce the weight of the product uh, or if the soap gets a little bit smaller, if there is a little less in the shampoo bottle, you have to you have to indicate that on the package. But you see, consumers don't always uh, uh, read that so carefully and they don't necessarily always compare this with previous purchases of the product. You might be able to get away with it. Is it ethical? Well, we could talk about that. We could argue back and forth on this, I would say. But is it done? Yes, it's definitely done. It's done all the time. The thing is now, um, is it effective? Well, it can certainly be effective, unless, of course, it could be that uh, consumer um, advocacy group uh, calls you out and publicizes that. If it's a particularly egregious form of downsizing, they might do it. But also, it depends on Weber's law. If you if you don't want consumers to notice that you downsized, you need to make sure that you stay below the differential threshold. Because if reduce it by more than the differential threshold, then consumers will uh, notice. And you know, obviously, then it's not working. If you if if, stay, if you're above the differential threshold, if you stay below the differential threshold, then uh, most consumers wouldn't notice the change. Okay, so much about sensing. Let's move on to the next stage, which is selecting and attending. Selecting and attending. Um, that's kind of a really interesting stage as well, in my opinion. Um, what I would like to point out here is that uh, consumer behavior, or no, not just consumer behavior, human behavior, is incredibly uh, selective and sp specifically um, uh, perception is incredibly selective. Uh, there are so many stimuli around us and we, we just can't uh, pay attention to all of them. We just can't expose ourselves to all of them. We just can't remember all of them. So there basically there are many, many selectivity operators in, uh, in our perceptual process. It starts with selective exposure. Think for a second about uh, the radio stations that you listen to, right? What are the radio stations that you listen to? Um, if you think about it, there are maybe, I don't know how many, maybe uh, some of you listen to a lot of radio stations, but most people only listen to a few. Maybe it's two or three that you listen to. But there are so many radio stations. And notice, please, this is a for an example of selective exposure because there are many radio stations you don't even listen to. You don't even expose yourself to it. Or a completely different example, think about political rallies, right? When there, is, when there are elections and parties or candidates have rallies where, where the candidate speaks. Right now, for example, in the United States, you know, there are the primaries and uh, right now not much is happening because of coronavirus, as we know. But before that, right, uh, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and before that, the other Democratic contenders, um, they had their rallies. Now, who goes to these rallies? It's a very well-known fact that it's almost all of the people who go to a rally are the uh, supporters of the candidate. So you won't find people that, um, that, that are kind of not for that candidate or kind of neutral, they usually don't go to the rallies. It's the supporters who go to the rallies. Of course, so the, the rallies really serve to activate the supporters and also to get media exposure and so on. So rallies certainly work, but the people you will find at the rally, most of them are already supporters of the candidate. So this is again, selective exposure, right? Because they go to the rally of the candidate that they like, they don't go to the rallies of the candidate uh, that they don't like. Now, it would be interesting, perhaps, if, we, if they also went to the rallies of the other candidates to hear what they have to say, but it's just not happening. Selective exposure. It's a fact of life. Um, 
we can't be everywhere. We can't see everything. We can't do everything. We can't expose ourselves to every type of information. What kind of newspapers do you read or online newspapers do you read? I mean, I read quite a few actually. I've even increased my subscriptions now. Uh, I have, uh, sub I now subscribe to uh, three newspapers and I read five newspapers regularly. I'm kind of a news junkie, I guess. But even I, you know, I mean, five newspapers, I mean, that's what I read regularly. There are many, 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 many more newspapers that I, that I don't read, right? Now I read maybe occasionally, I do read them, but not on a regular basis because, you know, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, <clears throat> so selective exposure. And then there are other selectivity operators, selective attention. This is what we're going to focus on now. But there's also selective interpretation, our mind, what we, what we further, the information that we further process is also selective. We don't further process everything. And all, even selective retention retrieval. This is about what we remember. We don't remember everything equally. That's very, very selective as well. But from these selectivity operators in our perceptional process, the one that we're gonna focus on now is selective attention. We don't pay attention to everything. We only pay attention to certain things. Um, here, what, first of all, what do we mean by attention? When we say attention, we mean the moment, momentary focusing of our intention, uh, information processing capacity on a particular stimulus. Because we need, we, 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 we need to focus on something. We can't focus on everything. We have to be selective. There are different types of attention, by the way. There is, um, Uh, there is um, planned attention. This is when we try to focus on something. So, for example, when you're in a lecture and you try to concentrate on the professor and what he or she says, this is a form of planned attention. Another form of planned attention is a consumer in a supermarket who looks for a particular product. So the consumer is, is, is searching for canned beans Okay, and he looks for the canned beans and says, where are they? That's gonna, let's plan the tension. Then we have involuntary attention. So for example, uh, loud noise, that would be a form of uh, involuntary attention. When there's a loud noise, we all look up at uh, what's happening, okay? We, 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 can't, we can't help ourselves but to pay attention at that very moment because of that, you know, that, that, that loud noise kind of startles us and draws our attention to it. And then there is the third form, which is spontaneous attention, which is kind of an, a combination of both. So let's say you go, uh, you go, you go on a walk with a friend, and you just walk down, you know, uh, you walk down the street, or maybe you walk down a green meadow or something like that. And this is spontaneous attention because, on the one hand, um, you you pay attention to you know to your steps obviously you know where's the path that we follow but at the same time you know if you notice something I don't know maybe a butterfly or or bird or whatever you have in your green meadow of your dreams right um, you notice that as well that would be kind of involuntary or maybe I don't know someone you can hear someone talk in the uh, close by that's also then involuntary so spontaneous a mixture of planned and involuntary. Now, uh, what I would like to, what I would like to do, uh, hold on a second. What I would like to do is I would like to show you a video. Some of you might notice already, might well be the case. Some of you don't. Um, this is very famous. Um, this is kind of um, tries to demonstrate selective attention. So let me show you this video. Um, what you're gonna see here in this video is you're gonna see uh, players. They play. Uh, uh, they play uh, uh, basketball, and there are players in white that wear a white t-shirt, and there are players uh, in uh, in black, I think. And what you should do, the two teams. I would like you to watch this video, and I would like you to count how many times the players wearing white pass. The basketball. Are you ready? Okay, then let me start this video again. So try to count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball.
How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. Okay, so yes, it was 15 passes, but right, this is not what the what the video is all about. Um, did anyone did anyone uh, know the video already? Just let me know in the chat, please. Just type yes or no. Did you know the video? Okay, so for you knew it, yeah. Okay, it's well known. How about the others? Okay, no? Okay. Some yes, some no. Okay, now, those of you who know it, you know the, what's, what comes next, right? Those of you who, who, don't, who didn't know the, the video, here's the thing, right? I asked you to count the passes, but is there anything that you noticed? Well, let me show you. But did you see the gorilla? Did you see the gorilla? There was a gorilla, there was a gorilla walking through this scene. And a lot of people don't notice the gorilla, right? Um, here, let me show you, they, or let me continue the video now. Here comes the gorilla. You see it now? If you haven't seen it before? Yeah, I mean, this person wearing the gorilla costume, and now he's gone. This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from FizCog Productions. Learn more at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Okay. Now, what does this video try to demonstrate? It demonstrates selective attention. Notice uh, your instructions were uh, to, to count how many times the team in white uh, passes uh, the basketball. And you did that. And... You focused on that. So you focused your attention on, 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 on that task. And because of that, a lot of, a lot of people don't notice something that seems very, very obvious. I mean, a gorilla, for God's sake, you know, a gorilla, you know, walking through the, through this scene. And still, we often don't notice it. We wouldn't, a lot of people wouldn't notice it uh, when they see this for the first time because, you know, they were focusing their attention on something else. So this is kind of a demonstration of uh, selective attention. As a matter of fact, I have a second video for you. For those of you who knew the first video, maybe uh, you don't know this video now. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The same instructions, right? The correct answer is 16 passes. Okay, right? Now, did you notice the gorilla now? Sure you did, because you everyone noticed the gorilla, I suppose, because, uh, yes, now you know that it's not just about the passes, it's about actually the gorilla, so you noticed the gorilla, right? Um, but let me ask you now, what else happened? Are there any other things happened, James? The curtains changed color, yes. That's one thing, yeah, the curtains changed the color. And what's the second thing? What's the second change that happened? Did anyone notice? It was all girls? Uh, something, something similar to that. Something, some, uh, something similar to that. Let me show you. Let me show you the solution. Did you spot the gorilla? Yes, of course we did, right? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Yes, one player left the game. Let's rewind and watch it again. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. How oh, very true, yeah, right? How oh, very true. We miss the other events. Um, so uh, that's uh, 
that's something to keep in mind. So first, right, we were, when we did, when you didn't know about the gorilla, or those of you who didn't know about the gorilla, you missed the gorilla because we were focusing on something else. You were focusing on the passes. But once you knew the gorilla, now you were focusing on the gorilla, but there are other, were other changes going on as well. Uh, and maybe you, maybe you noticed the, maybe you noticed the, the curtain, but yes, there was yet another change that was happening. You know, we can't focus on everything. I mean, the moment that the gorilla came in, the person left, right? Of course, you looked at the gorilla because you knew this was a video about the gorilla. So selective attention. It's happening all the time. And it's not necessarily something bad, by the way. It seems like, you know, oh, it's a mistake we make and so on. It could be, but selective attention is necessary because you can't pay attention to everything. Imagine if you can't pay attention to everything, attention deficit disorder, right? That, you don't want that. So selective attention is not a bad thing. Now, as marketers, how can we attract attention? What can we do to attract uh, people's attention to our product or to our brand? We, you learned about this already in our last class, shopper marketing, but here's a, maybe a few more things and a bit of a review. Uh, to attract attention, the main possibilities that you have is you can use position and contrast. Position is uh, the size of a stimulus. If something is big, it will be noticed more easily than when it's small. And placement. Look at this uh, blimp here, uh, uh, here over the um, over the stadium. Right in a stadium, they have all this advertising here that you need to pay for. But this company just sent the blimp, and of course, everyone looked up there because of where it was up there in the sky. You know, so it got a lot of attention. The second thing is also about uh, the placement. This is something you guys know really, really well. Eye level is bi level, as we discussed at length last semester. Whatever is at the consumer's eye level in a store will be noticed much more and will also has a high, higher chance of being bought. Placement. And the, sec and the, second, um, the second characteristic to att attract attention is contrast. So a change in the environment also leads to uh, attraction, also attracts people, uh, people pay attention to it. So for example, if you have very bright colors or something like that, the intensity of the color, movement attracts attention. If something moves, we, 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 we notice it, we focus our attention on it, the colors and so on. However, there's also something called adaptation theory or, that, or adaptation principle. This principle states that after a while, People adapt to constant levels of stimuli and they pay less attention to them. It's kind of interesting. Um, one might think, you know, if I make, if I turn up the sound, uh, the, the volume of the music, if I make it really loud, people will pay, pay attention to it. Or if I have a bright light, then people will pay attention to it. Yes, it works, but it only works for a while because after a while, our organism kind of uh, adapts to that uh, intensity and we won't notice anymore. Think for a moment uh, of, the following, of the following example. Let's say you go out, I mean, right now we can't do this, but you know, someday when we, when things reopen again and we can go out, uh, then, you know, let's say you go to a club. You go to that club and um, it's very, very, they play very loud music, uh, a very, uh, you know, very high intensity, the sound. Uh, when you enter the club, you notice that, wow, okay, it's really, really loud. But after a while, it feels perfectly normal because you have adapted to that, okay? Then after a couple of hours, you step out into the night, okay? It's four o'clock in the morning. You're on your way home. You step out and you notice you can hear the silence now. You can hear the silence, the sound of silence, really. Why? Well, because it was a change in intensity. So the silence is, 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 is you're aware of that. Now, after a while, of course, the silence becomes normal again, and then you don't notice it anymore. The same thing about the temperature. Maybe inside the club, it was really, really hot. And after a while, okay, it could be that it's so hot that you, that, you, that you notice. I mean, if you start sweating all the time, that's different. But it was, let's say it was warm. Uh, you didn't notice after a while it was really warm. But when you stepped out in the night, it was cooler. And you notice the change in difference. After a while, unless it's really, really cold, you wouldn't notice that anymore. Because, again, we have adapted to it. 
So that's really adaption theory or the adaption principle. Um, I also would like to point out that um, attracting attention is very different from maintaining attention. And in my opinion, a lot of marketers get, uh, you know, make a mistake here. You see, there are, there are many marketers uh, who are very good at attracting attention. They find all kinds of novel stimuli to attract attention, to shock people, you know, uh, or to surprise them. I mean, creative types, you know, are really, really good at that. Um, so they do a, mostly, I would say, a lot of marketers and advertisers do a really good job at, at attracting attention. It's not easy because others do it as well, right? Advertising clutter and all of that. But they're good at that. But what a lot of them get wrong is that they don't realize how important it is to maintain the attention because I can easily attract the attention of someone. You know, um, if you show something shocking or if you show something very beautiful or something surprising or, I don't know, naked people or something like this, this attracts attention, no doubt about it. But look, for example, here with this baby, this baby will attract attention because um, we are biologically programmed to it, as you already know. The baby schema, right? The, the round face, the big eyes. But um, this is just attracting the attention. Whether you will continue to uh, devote your attention to this stimulus, to this picture, depends very much on you, on you, the consumer. You know, are you interested in babies? Do you, you know, are you thinking about having a baby, or is that the furthest thing from your mind right now? This, for example, will determine whether you. Uh, uh, maintain your attention to it. So, we, so attracting attention is simply not enough because attracting attention depends on the stimulus. Maintaining attention depends on the consumer, on the person. So, and as marketers, of course, we need to be able both to attract and to maintain attention. Um, Here's another interesting thing, uh, because uh, I show you this because uh, a lot of students are kind of interested in this, I, I noticed. You, many of you have heard that before, perhaps, um, which is subliminal perception. A subliminal perception would mean that the stimulus is presented below the absolute threshold of perception. Remember psychophysics, the absolute threshold? What, that's kind of the level at which you notice a stimulus. If it's if the stimulus is presented below that absolute threshold, we would call it subliminal, subliminal perception. Um, <clears throat> and um, in the 1950s in the United States, there was a marketing consultant by the name of Vickery. And Mr. Vickery uh, um, told people that he had made an experiment. And in that experiment, what he did was in a movie theater, he had rented a movie theater and he showed people a movie. And during the movie, he was subliminally uh, showing uh, the messages, drink Coca-Cola and eat popcorn. Now, how did he do that? Well, you know how a movie has, what, uh, 24, usually 24 pictures per second. And from time to time, he put another frame in there that would then say, you know, eat popcorn or drink Coca-Cola. And Mr. Vickery claimed that when he did that, and he did this several times during the movie, and then during the break, you know, at the concession there, they, they, he claimed that uh, sales for Coca-Cola and for popcorn skyrocketed. Lots of people wanted to drink Coke and eat popcorn. Cool, right? Very sneaky, very manipulative. But of course, marketers are like, wow, okay, we need to use this. Here was the thing now, guys. You can even read this sometimes in uh, some, some marketing textbooks, this story. But here's the thing. It's completely fake. Not Mr. Vickery. He was real, but he never actually carried out this study. He just claimed that he did to get money. He was a fraud, you know. Sorry to say for marketing consultants. I'm a mar not just a professor. I'm a consultant as well, a marketing consultant. So... What can I say? But, you know, there are some marketing consultants and other consultants that, you know, are not very ethical. Uh, and he was one of them. Um, uh, he never he never conducted a study and he, he got money from big consumer package manufacturers and then he took off and disappeared. Well, 
so much for that. And of course, you know, uh, the story nowadays is that this has happened and so on. So, but when you read this on the internet, or even when you know a well-meaning professor tells you about that story, now you know it's actually fake. It never happened. However, uh, of course, because of that, then uh, consumer researchers got interested in 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 this. Uh, in this idea, and they did real experiments, real studies to show if subliminal perception would be possible. Uh, so they did controlled experiments, and the thing is, the outcome of these experiments was the outcomes of these experiments were really that uh, subliminal perception is probably not really uh, effective. The, the, the findings are big years. There were some studies that showed some effects. Uh, of subliminal perception. Uh, there were other studies that showed no effect. Most studies actually showed no effect. I myself also wanted to know myself. So a couple of years ago, I did a study myself where I replicated something like this. I uh, was with, uh, with a video and we put in scenes of, of, of soft drinks and so on and see, then looked how people reacted. And we didn't have any effect either. So basically I can tell you if there are any effects, if at all, at least they're, either there are no, no effects or if there are, there are tiny effects, irrelevant effects, really. So, yes, it sounds cool that um, subliminal uh, perception, but it's not really working. It much, it's much better if in the movie theater you put the sign which says, you know, drink Coca-Cola or here, buy some popcorn at, at, at the concession during your break. You're going to, you're going to have, uh, you will be much more successful doing that than, you know, trying to have subliminal perception. Another thing is of course, also people often confuse this with persuasion without awareness. Um, in persuasion without awareness, it's not subliminal because the stimulus is not presented below the absolute threshold. It is presented above the threshold. Um, so people can actually see it or hear it. It's just they don't pay it. They don't necessarily pay a, pay attention to it. Uh, so this is a different story. So for example, you know, um, uh, here in here in this scene, when you when you look at my office, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you may have noticed Donald Duck, my hero, right back there. Okay, here is Donald, uh, his usual friendly self. <clears throat> Okay, uh, and right, this is not something very obvious. I mean, okay, it's kind of obvious. I mean, probably most of you might have noticed it before, but maybe not everyone did. I could put it back somewhere else, you know, uh, where, it's, where it's smaller when, when you see it here. Um, so that might be, you, you, perhaps you didn't notice it. And it may something like this may still have an effect maybe, right? Or maybe I put some flowers on my desk and you see it in the background and maybe kind of this has an effect on you as well. May or may not have an effect. Uh, there could be some effects actually, uh, some subtle effects of such stimuli that are not very obvious. So this does exist. But notice please, this is not subliminal perception because you can see it or you can hear it. It's just not something that's very obvious. You may not pay attention to it. So yes, persuasion without awareness is certainly possible. Um, some effects are certainly possible um, and may be also used by marketers, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> but subliminal perception, forget about it. It's mostly just uh, humbug. Okay, guys, this leads us to the last stage in the perceptual process, and that is interpretation. Okay. Um, we have sent, the consumer has sensed the stimuli, has then chosen certain stimuli to further process. Now, how are the stimuli interpreted? Let's have a look at this. There are different stages in information interpretation. First there is organization. Stimuli need to be organized. That means stimuli that fit together need to be organized. They, a consumer needs or the person needs to kind of uh, be clear what belongs together. So the mind kind of needs to tell us, okay, these stimuli fit together. So this is one object and this is another object. That's what we mean by organization. Then there is categorization. So whatever we saw or heard or smelled or tasted, what is it? What category does it belong to? And third, 
perceptual inferences. These are inferences that we have kind of like we go beyond what we see or hear. What does it mean? Okay, let's look at them. First, uh, perceptual organization. Um, perceptual organization is a, is a field that was studied by the so-called Gestalt psychologist. Yes, it's a German word, but it's also used in English, Gestalt. It, why is it German? Because it was German researchers uh, in the mm, 1940s, I think, 1940s, 1950s, who kind of started this field. And these, it's the so-called good gestalt. And good gestalt means that people perceived organized wholes rather than just separate parts. Sounds complicated, but it's actually quite simple, at least to understand. Look at this picture here, right? Uh, what you see, I would say most of you will see a face, right? But look, it's actually tiny little pictures of uh, houses, of facades. Well, but we don't just focus on the facades. We don't, don't just focus on these individual pictures. We see the, we see the whole. And then the whole, so to say, is, what is, the, is, is, is the face. So the, um, there is an organized whole, really. There is an organized total uh, picture that we see here, which is this face. Now, Gestalt psychology is interested again. Again, Gestalt psychology is interested in how people organize or how humans organize stimuli. How they determine which stimuli belong together. That's important for us because otherwise we wouldn't know something like, let's say, here, this glass. How do I know that this is the glass and this is my finger? How do I know that this is the glass and this is my face? Right? Make sense? So how do I know that this belongs together? This is one object. Well, this can be explained by the Gestalt principles. Cheers. Mm. So let's look at them. Uh, the first principle is called figure and ground. Uh, tell me in the chat, please, who of you knows this, uh, this picture? Who of you has seen this before? Just say yes or no. <clears throat> okay, Sophie, how about the others? Have you seen this before or not? Yes or no? You can quickly do this. Okay. Um, no? Okay, yes, no? Well, those of you who don't know it, um, look, this, is a, this, is, uh, this picture, you can see either an old woman or a young woman. Now, uh, but you can't see both at the same time. Um, now, let's say if you see the old woman, right, you could see this is her nose here, right? She has a big nose, right? Okay. If you see the young woman, okay, this here is her face. You see the profile of her face. This is a feather that she has on her elegant uh, uh, head or something like this. Okay, you you may not see you may not may, maybe it take a while for you maybe to see to see one or the other then if you kind of uh, if you see one of them now uh, you can by the way go back on the internet you'll find this if you type something like old woman young woman uh, drawing or something like this you will find it I mean it's 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 very well known um, <clears throat> but. The reason why I show it to you is because it kind of um, demonstrates this gestalt principle of figure and ground. Figure and ground means we always perceive something. We always perceive something as the figure and the rest of the background. It's very very important for us because otherwise I wouldn't know it's the glass and the rest. Everything else is the background. Now in this case, you see, the thing is, you can either see the old woman or you can see the young woman. Uh, you can switch also, but you can never see both at the same time. Because when you when you see the young woman, then the rest is the background, okay? It's the ground. When you see the old woman, well, then the rest is the background again. So this is kind of a demonstration of this figure and ground principle. 
Uh, here you can see uh, an advertiser, a marketer who kind of makes fun of this figure and crown uh, principle, right? This is for jeans, Wrangler jeans. And the funny thing is here, it plays with this figure and crown because this kind of obviously symbolizes the jeans, right? But you see how this is like a cutout and you can see like the background also. So what's figure, what's ground, right? The background becomes the figure. The figure is the background and so on. Um, here there's different gestalt principles. You have the principle of continuation. You see here these two lines? Well, here are four lines, right? A, B, C, and D. Which ones belong together? A and B, D and C, A and D, C and B. Well, I guess we would all say A and B belong together and C and D belong together. That's continuation because it's continuous. We wouldn't say, okay, this A, if you follow my mouse here, goes up to here and then it continues like this, doesn't make sense for us. We would say this belongs together, it's continuation. Or closure, you can see the principle of closure here also. Here you also see the principle of closure um, in this ad here. Look at the, I mean, there is this picture, but then beneath it, uh, there's this sentence, the headline. And notice that letters are missing and still, we can still read it. Like your brain, the new Land Rover automatically adjusts to anything. Well, closure, right? Even if there's something missing, the mind fills in what's missing in there. Principles of principle of closure. Also here, obviously it's not jingle bell, jingle bells, jingle bells, but jingle bells, jingle bells. Principle of closure. Here, principle of similarity on the left uh, hand side. You see what which which belongs together, the the rows or the columns, rows or columns. Well, here. Most of us would say, or almost everyone would say, it's the rows that belong together because of the color, right? Because the red ones belong together and the black ones belong together. We wouldn't we wouldn't perceive this as a we wouldn't perceive this as a figure and this as a figure. No, this is a figure and this is a figure. Or proximity, what belongs together? Well, this belongs together and that belongs together. For just a tiny aside, when you make slides for your slide presentations. Use, for example, the proximity principle. Um, make sure that whatever belongs together is also close together. Otherwise, you confuse people. Symmetry. This belongs together and that belongs together here, right? Connectedness. This belongs together, this belongs together, and this belongs together. Then we have what's called perceptual context. Perceptual concept is a uh, perceptual context is a principle that states that um, the the surroundings uh, affect how we perceive something. So the various stimuli will affect our perceptions, even if we're not uh, conscious of it happening. So let's say let's say if I if I ask you about these two lines here, you can see two lines, right? This one on top and this one at the bottom. These two lines, which one is longer? Well, some of you might know it's a trick question, of course, because they are the same length. And still, we can't heart, we can't, uh, we can't uh, help but perceive this, you know, th these two lines as, 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 as longer or shorter because of these other stimuli, these, uh, these hooks there at the end, which kind of, influence our with influence uh, within with, uh, which influence our uh, perception okay so that's the perceptual concept uh, principle here is another uh, <clears throat> so here are a couple of other uh, principles uh, with regards to uh, gestalt there is perceptual constancy and perceptual set Perceptual constancy is re really means that we strive to perceive our world as a relatively unchanging environment. An unchanging environment, how, how, how can that be? Well, basically what's meant by this is that our world changes around us constantly. There is constant change, but we often don't notice this change because it's gradual, okay? And we, our mind, our mind kind of strives to, perceive something perceive uh, something that's constant 
So we often don't notice this change. Now, of course, if there's a very strong change or a very abrupt change, we might notice this. But if the change is gradually, we don't notice that change. That's perceptual constancy. So this tendency to perceive our world as a relatively unchanging environment. Perceptual set simply means that we're kind of set in our ways. We, we perceive something in a certain way and, and, and we may always perceive it that way uh, because we are just set in our ways. Let me give you examples of this. Um, this uh, is an example that some of you might know. Here in Austria, there is a, there is a company called Holland Blumenmark. Um, and and um, they have store signs, of course, that would show us uh, that would show us the that would show us the name. But you see, a lot of people, when you ask them about this company, and you ask them what's the what's the name of the company, they would say it's called Holland Blumen Markt with a T, because in German, Markt, market, right? Flower, Blumen is flower, by the way, or Holland, Dutch flower market. That's what the, they sell flowers, obviously, right? Uh, but people wouldn't say mark. They don't, they, they, most Austrians would say Blumen Markt because market, marked in German, is what, what people are used to. And the Dutch word is actually mark. The Dutch word for market is mark, but since people speak German here and not Dutch, they would put the T there. And that's, a, that's, that's an example of perceptual constancy and perceptual set. Uh, even if t, the T is not there in reality and people still see this T or they assume there is a T because there's supposed to be a T because whenever there is mark, there is a T at the end. So if there is no T here, there must be a T. That's not something that people reflect upon as obvious, uh, upon, uh, obviously because you know it's not that important for most people, uh, but they perceive it as something that's uh, that's um, that, that it's there. So that's perceptual constancy and the perceptual set. Okay, so much about so much about that. Uh, the second stage in this interpretation phase is categorization. Categorization means that um, we once we know what belongs together, we categorize what this object is. Again, here's this class, right? And I say it's a glass. It could be something else as well, right? First, my mind, my mind determined that this thing, all of this is one thing, and everything else is the background. But then it's a glass. I categorized it as such. It could be something else. It's not, it's not a horse. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a pen. It's not a person. You know, if, you, if I thought this was a person, you know, I'm in serious trouble. This is a glass. I still know that, okay? I mean... Spending all time, all the time inside, or most of the time inside, feels like almost like you know, like this. But I'm still kind of sane, mostly. So I categorize this as a class. Sometimes consumers have problem categorizing objects or brands or products. Uh, it's called miscategorization. And miscategorization, you know, like here. Let's say if you look at these pictures down there. Uh, at first glance, you may say, hmm, well, "What is this?" Well, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's rice or something like this. But if you look more carefully, it's not a rice, it's actually bird feed. Um, hmm, what, are the, what are the implications of this? The implications is that we need to help consumers in their categorization. Uh, we need to make sure that they don't miscategorize new products. Uh, sometimes miscategorization can even be very, very serious. There were cases when there were mm, detergents, like liquid detergents, that had bottles there was a liquid detergent that had a bottle that looked like a soft drink bottle. And there were some kids who miscategorized it and drank it. I mean, fortunately, nobody died, but, you know, they uh, were sent to the hospital. And then the company obviously changed this because it looked like a lemon soft drink, right? Like lemonade or, or, or something like that, or lemon soda. Um, <clears throat> so this was a clear cut of miscategorization. Not every miscategorization is that serious, but still, you know, if you... Uh, launch a new product on the market and people think it's something different than what it really is, if, if they don't know what it is, then you have a problem. So you really need to help when you have a new product, you need to help people uh, ca to categorize it. And there are different strategies for it. I won't go into detail for all of those, but uh, one example would be 
uh, I'll leave that now, would be a so-called exemplar strategy. An exemplar strategy is that you compare the new product to something that's already known. So like, you know, if you love original and sour Pringles, you will simply adore onion and cheese Pringles, right? So it's it's a different, looks a little bit different, it's a different packaging, but it's still Pringles, okay? So you kind of, that's an exemplar strategy. You compare it to something. Now, by the way, about this categorization, how do we categorize um, objects in our mind? Well, we use what's called, a, we use so-called scammers. Scammers are cognitive structures in our long-term memory, associative networks, as you already know, right? And this is basically what a person knows about the given object of behavior, right? So if you take soft drinks, I don't know, one person may think it has bubbles, it's cheap, it's for kids, it's non-alcoholic, it's sweet, it's unhealthy, it has a lot of sugar, and so on. Okay, this is a schema. And now, if you have a soft drink, obviously you want to make sure that it has enough features, enough cues, uh, that people will categorize it as a soft drink and not as a... As a as a detergent or not as an alcoholic drink or not as something else. So you need to make sure that in our associative network, in our mind, uh, new products are categorized the right way. You could also, you could also, uh, consumers also have scripts uh, to categorize things. Not everything is, uh, is categorized in a script, a specific type of schema. This is like for a process. You see, uh, something that, that people do, uh, they, we would have scripts for that. It's also a, a schema, but it, it goes step by step, really. So, for example, you know, uh, starting your car and driving off uh, from your home, you may, have a, you may have a script for that. So maybe the first thing is you usually check pockets for your wallet and your keys. You lock the door of your apartment. You go to the carport. You open the car door to the driver's seat. Then you fasten the seatbelt, you check the mirror settings. Then maybe you always turn right on the street to enter the gas station. You stop the car, you check the gas level, and so on. So this is like kind of a script. We have scripts for, uh, for many different aspects of our lives. We have a script, I don't know, how to brush our teeth. We have scripts for, uh, I don't know, going to the supermarket. We have a script for, I don't know, drinking our coffee, our cappuccino in the morning, or whatever it is that you drink in the morning, right? And so on. Um, so the, these scripts are also schemas, but they are a special form of schema for an organized sequence of events. But anyway, regular scripts, or regular schemas of scripts, they definitely help us organize stimuli. And categorize our stimuli particularly, because depending on where we put something in a schema, uh, it will be categorized as such. Well, let's come to the last step in uh, the perceptual process. In my opinion, it's the most interesting one, because this uh, last step, uh, perceptual inferences, is the one where marketers can also be very creative. Perceptual inferences. Perceptual inferences is really uh, kind of making sense of a stimulus, making sense of, 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 of an object that we now perceive as an object, not separate stimuli anymore, and kind of att to attach meaning to it. And that just goes beyond just saying, okay, it's in this category, or this belongs together, or anything like that you perceptual inferences um, the key word here is inferential belief an inferential belief is a developed belief about something and it's based on other information it's a tentative conclusion about an object and how do we form these uh, perceptual inferences will we form them through sensory cues so basically there are sensory cues Something that we see, that we hear, that we smell, that we taste. And based on this, we make inferences. Our brain, based on previous information that we have stored in long-term memory, makes inferences what characteristic this product or this service or the person that we see uh, is likely to have. To give you an example, I think it's much easier uh, to explain with an example, is like this. Here's an ice cream cone, okay? 
And I'm kind of surprised how my how my how my animation <laughs> turned out because it was not supposed to be that big. I have no idea why that happened now. But anyway, you have a nice big ice cream cone here. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of shocked at how it appeared on my screen. Uh, so here's this big nice ice cream cone. My question for you is, what flavor is the ice cream cone? Tell me, tell me in the chat. What's the flavor? You know what the flavor is. Come on, tell me. Chocolate. Yeah, of course it's chocolate. Yes, you knew it. You see, I knew that you knew. But notice, please, there's nothing actually that says chocolate here. I mean, to really, to really to make that inference, uh, you would have to taste the ice cream. But how can you taste the ice cream? It's just strong, right? It's just a drawing. It's just a weird animation that kind of happened. Uh, and but still, you say chocolate. I say chocolate. Most people would say chocolate. Who knows? Maybe someone else said. I don't know. Would say I don't know. Uh, coffee, maybe, or something like that, or Nutella, you know, or something like that. Or how about James? How about Marmite, right? <laughs> uh, it's also brown, I guess, kind of. But most people would say chocolate because this is kind of what what brown ice cream people associate that with chocolate. But notice, please, there is nothing in the stimulus itself that is is clear it's chocolate, and still we make the inference. And that's kind of fascinating because this is where marketers really can play around with this. So as marketers, we can we can develop inferences, inferential beliefs in people about many, many different things. Sometimes with very subtle cues that still lead to certain that still lead to certain beliefs. Uh-huh. Now <laughs> it's back to normal. Uh, okay, so for example, right? It could be things like a consultant, a well-dressed consultant. The, the, you know, the suit and the tie and the elegant shoes and stuff like that means the consultant is successful. Is he really? Maybe not, right? There is a marmot ice cream. Mmm, delicious, delicious. Like a thousand-year-old eggs, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, so well-dressed well-dressed consultant, uh, a well-dressed consultant must be successful. Maybe it's not. Maybe the guy, you know, is a complete loser who has no idea, is not successful, doesn't make any money, uh, isn't good at what he does and so on. But he is well-dressed, so, you know, a lot of people think this person must be consult uh, must be must be successful. Now, obviously, we look at other cues as well, right? I'm not just saying the way the consultant dresses is the only cue, the only sensory cue that will lead to an inference, because maybe we look at other things as well, right? We probably look at other things as well, but it does lead to an inferential belief. Or think about the lemon scent, the lemon scent of a dish liquid. It removes grease. Why? Well, because we know that uh, if the mm, le lemon, lemon juice Really, uh, lemon juice remo uh, removes grease, right? So if it's if this dish liquid has a lemon scent, it must also remove grease. That's why in this country here, uh, a lot of uh, dish liquid is actually le lemon scented because people people want it that way because then they think it it, it works well. It, of course, there's no lemon in dishwashing liquid, right? I mean, there isn't because I mean it's a chemical formulation I don't think if you put lemon juice in there I don't think this would work uh, but the lemon scent is there because it it's this indication it, it leads to these inferential beliefs the color of a package can lead to taste perceptions I've done studies like that myself also where depending on uh, what you what what uh, I did once once a, a study with chocolate bananas and we put them in different colored packages and depending on the package there were you know the taste changed also. Um, other example, maybe uh, laundry detergent. You may have noticed sometimes in laundry detergent there are little speckles in there, little blue dots or something like this. Why are they in there? Well, these uh, blue dots are in there because um, because uh, people, when, when these little blue dots are in the laundry detergent, consumers think that the laundry detergent is more effective. Again, they developed an inferential belief 
about the uh, laundry detergent based on the little blue dots. So other cues could be the brand name, the price. If it's expensive, it must be high quality. If it's cheap, it must be low quality. Maybe true or it may not be true, right? But it's an inferential belief we may develop. The store atmosphere, something we talked about it at length in our uh, course last semester. All of these are cues and there are many, many more that can lead to inferential beliefs. Well, I believe that after, I don't even know how long now, a long time, uh, we started at 1.30, wow, okay. After two and a half hours, this very, very long online lecture uh, is over. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me, those of you who are here. Um, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon, a wonderful evening, hang in there. Uh, I hope to see you again in our next online course. Now we are on break, of course, for two weeks, but after that I would be Glad if you would come back. I wish you all the best. In particular, I also wish your families all the best. You guys stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, keep in touch. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.